I just want to welcome you all here today and my name is Jan Breckenridge and I'm going to be your MC so I'm mic'd up like Madonna and I will be here today any issues come and see me or anyone with a blue tag but before we move on um, one of the most important things we can do we have Auntie Lola Callahan here to provide a welcome. On behalf of the Bidjigal and Gadigal clans who traditionally occupied the Sydney coast I will welcome you all here today to this very important summit. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, one of our co-hosts, um, who is uh, Professor Henry Bradati. Now, uh, Henry is actually a scientia professor and he's the acting head of the School of Psychiatry, but he's been incredibly generous in his funding of the event and very committed to issues of social justice and human rights. Well, a very warm welcome to everybody from the School of Psychiatry in the University of New South Wales. Can you hear me at the back? Oh. Yep, okay. Um, to the second National Dowry Abuse Summit here at UNSW. We're very proud to be hosting this event. Today, we'll be hearing about dowry abuse from experts, from advocates, and from those who can make policy. But we all know what counts and what drives change and what resonates most are the stories from those people who've lived through this experience. As we know, dowry involves the bride's family paying the groom and his family a dowry of cash, gold, gifts and property, maybe not all of those, at the time of marriage. It's common, however, for grooms to escalate their demands for additional sums, and this has resulted in violence, abandonment and even death when brides do not comply. This is now being viewed as a form of domestic violence in Australia, affecting many women and families from migrants and refugee backgrounds. And of course, it's not just in Australia. It's a universal problem and a significant cause for mental disorder, which is where the School of Psychiatry comes in. It's a contributor to burden of disease in women. I was truly amazed when I read these statistics that it actually ranks ahead of obesity and hypertension as a cause of disease burden. Susan Rees has published evidence of the impact of violence against women at a population level here in Australia. It's associated with a number of mental health conditions, mood disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorder, substance abuse, suicidal behaviour, as well as poor quality of life. I looked up Google on this, and I find that one week ago, the ABC News reported that the Senate inquiry called for new laws identifying dowry-related abuse as domestic violence. And the people responsible for this are here in this room. It also listed related stories. Senate inquiry to dowry abuse to probe devastating impacts on women. My particular area of clinical experience, research and advocacy has been in the field of dementia. And what I learnt in that field is that to reach politicians, to influence bureaucrats, to bring the community along with us, we needed evidence, that's the research. We need to show cost benefit, and there's certainly a lot of cost with mental health problems, and we needed to tell the stories. It was not enough just to feed people's minds. We needed to reach the hip pocket, and we needed to touch their hearts. This program will clearly do all of that. I'm so impressed by the standard of speakers, the comprehensive nature of the content. I congratulate you, the organisers, and uh, thank you for all for attending and best wishes for the summit. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to co-host the second national summit on dowry abuse. For over a decade, uh, we have seen dowry exploited in marriage through our work in the field of family violence and financial counselling. It is a practice that remains largely unidentified and unrecognised within legal and policy frameworks. It is now my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the Honourable Linda Burney to provide an address for us this morning. Linda was elected Federal Member for Barton in 2016. Uh, can I thank Lola for her um, welcome and acknowledgement? 
um, and sharing, I think, what was a really important message, everyone, for all of us. And, is th and that is that we that share this country um, have a shared history and the uh, 60,000 years that's part of my cultural story is also part of yours. And I think that's a, a fine message for Lola to give us. I'm not going to stand here and tell you what dowry abuse is. You wouldn't be here if you, um, if you uh, didn't know that. But I did want to say that this week the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee handed down its report on the practice of dowry and the incidence of dowry abuse in Australia, which of course Julian and Louise were so instrumental in. Now, we hear often on the news there's Senate reports handed down, and quite often it is true. They sit on a nice table or a nice um, uh, shelf somewhere and gather dust. This one will not. This one actually will not sit and gather dust. It did, everyone, shine a light on the varied, varied and insidious forms of which dowry abuse occurs. Perhaps the most obvious are the stories of physical abuse, the beatings, the domestic violence, the de and sexual servitude, and the tragic loss of life. We need to ensure that our laws remain relevant and up to date, not merely, merely sufficient to counter physical abuse, but laws that shine the light on our justice system, on the kind of abuse not so easily evidenced by bruises and scars. Can I finish up by saying um, that our future discussions about extending our efforts to prevent family violence to women of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds is a genuine commitment. In Touch is very proud to co-host today's summit. For those of you who don't know, in Touch is a specialist family violence organisation in Victoria that's been delivering support services to women from refugee and migrant communities for 35 years. Our vision is for culturally diverse families to live free from violence. At In Touch, we've decided to focus on the issue of dowry abuse for two reasons. One, we believe we've got the knowledge and experience to contribute, and two, the experience of dowry abuse as an expression of economic abuse is quite distinct. It does require us to understand how dowry abuse is at the intersection of systemic barriers. It's not just about culture. Australia's migration laws and its definition of family violence are creating significant harm. So I'd like to introduce Julian Hill, the federal member for Bruce. Julian currently serves as the deputy chair of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit and has served as a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment and Growth. Um, thank you for the introduction and I'm really pleased to be here today. Just a few brief acknowledgements to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. Um, uh, to Senator Louise Pratt, uh, who's my oldest friend in the parliament from when we were 19, and we actually did, I'll tell you the story in a second of how we cooked up this inquiry, um, but to Ted Bailey, but also to Manjula O'Connor. I met Manjula some years ago now at an Indian festival in a chai queue, and there was a problem with the chai, and the queue wasn't moving very fast, so we just struck up this really long conversation and decided we kind of liked each other and we should catch up and that we had all this stuff in common, so what a wonderful accidental meeting that was. Um, but it is such a long way we've come since the first summit in Melbourne which I attended. Um, the Victorian legislation to implement the Royal Commission into Family Violence, the recommendations, and um, I am proud to be a Victorian in that regard. And um, I've learnt already in Canberra, Linda will attest, that they say you can tell a Victorian, just not much. But <laughs> we, are, we are really proud of the work and um, in a positive way, hopefully infecting our national discourse now with some of the pioneering thinking, I think, that was done in the last term of government. We've seen growing community <laughs> awareness and debate um, to the many people who've been part of that, the hard slog of media and getting this stuff into the public consciousness. It just takes so much effort and work over many years and the Senate report. Um, but it was at that first summit that I first learnt about dowry abuse and I had no idea, like most Australians. Um, I sat down and heard from the victims and that was powerful um, and learnt how extensive the problem is. And it was shocking enough to hear that it was a cause of murders and suicides. 
Um, but when you really delved into it and started to understand the systemic, systemic nature of it, I think most Australians would be shocked to learn and are still not aware that marriage has become a lucrative, um, a lucrative business because of the globalisation of migration. This is not a problem which is confined to Australia alone. It is a, a pattern we now see in many wealthy developed countries around the world with the promise of citizenship or permanent residence creates this market, um, and that's a reality. Um, I'll just be honest at the outset, and this is cathartic, I can't stand the idea of dowry myself. Um, I had an initial reaction to it. I was raised by a single mother. My only child is a daughter. I was a single dad to a daughter. Women are not property, and the idea in modern Australia that we see a price put on a woman um, at the extreme form of dowry to me is abhorrent. Um, but it was through listening to the evidence and my friendship with Mangela that I also came to realise that a simplistic response in the Australian context of just saying, don't do dowry, let's make it illegal, is not going to help the problem. Um, as Linda said, it will drive it further underground um, and make it much harder then to make beneficial changes in areas such as family law, migration, uh, property settlements and so on. So if you like, um, the whole philosophy, I think, of the Senate report, not that we've used that language, is a harm minimisation approach. We have to acknowledge the harm that's been done and focus there. Um, I did speak up in Parliament after the Dowry Summit and there was a strong reaction. I got lots of strange emails and calls and messages and I was surprised by that, um, but in a positive and negative way from people saying, thank goodness, someone's talking up nationally about this, but also from um, some men's groups telling me that this was not a problem and thank you so much to particularly the survivors, um, you can say victims, but I think survivors of dowry abuse who had the courage to come and tell their stories, and Louise can say in a moment how powerful that was. Um, look, Linda's touched on the key recommendations around family law, and um, I think I read all the submissions, and they were, they were wonderful. They really were. And um, much of it was predictable in a way, a necessary predictable, but they outlined things we'd heard. Firstly, uh, that also the definition of family violence in the migration regulations needs to be broadened, because the current definition is vague, uh, and unreasonably narrow and allows immigration far too much discretion to simply ignore huge swathes of real family violence that's occurring. Um, secondly, extending the family violence provisions in the migration regulations to apply to other family visa subclasses that they currently do not apply to. Now, I know firsthand how important that is because my electorate is one of the most multicultural in the country, in Dandenong. Um, people speak 200 different languages and come from 150 different countries and every day in my office there's people from multicultural backgrounds on temporary visas and the many problems that arise from that status and indeed exploitation. And so that also led to a recommendation about the creation of a new temporary visa available to non-family temporary visa holders who have suffered serious uh, and proven family violence. It's a little comparable with the woman at risk visa. Australia welcomes every year about 500 um, permanent migrants resettled here who are considered women at risk, or at risk by the United Nations uh, Refugee Commission. We should be proud of that, um, uh, but surely we can do better with women who are at risk living in Australia on valid visas in our own community. Um, so I think that's a really important um, recommendation. Um, and the final, the final area which was quite innovative and I don't think we'd thought about, but it was the work of Mangela and Jatinder and Estella and some real thinkers, is to think about more innovative uses of the sponsorship mechanism. Because currently it's a little bit unbalanced. So if you're in Australia and you want to sponsor someone from overseas, that person has to tell Australia everything about themselves. Criminal records, health records, financial, education, everything. And yet the sponsor can tell whatever lies they like. They can make up their employment status, make up their income status, not disclose their criminal history, not disclose their marital history, not disclose they've had three more brides and ripped them off. So using that sponsorship mechanism, not for the department to check, but at least for them to facilitate the information exchange so that if lies are told later on, then it's a lie that's been told to the department. And I do believe if the recommendations are implemented properly, they'll make a real difference to the problem of dowry abuse in Australia. And in terms of the government, I'd hope that the Attorney General would have the courage to change his mind now, having read the report and the evidence there. 
I know Mandela's leadership now globally, recognising the transnational nature of the issues is so important. So I congratulate you for putting your time in and thank you as we continue the journey together. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've been warned to keep everything very short, so I will um, thank you on um, a waiver's behalf. I'd like to thank the Australasian Centre for Human Rights and Health and UNSW Gendered Violence Research Network for the opportunity to contribute to this event today, and we're proud to do so. Australian Women Against Violence Alliance is a national alliance of organisations working to end violence against women in all its forms. And we look forward to working with um, community workers, community organisations, legislators and policy makers, including those in the room today, to address dowry abuse as a form of domestic and family violence. So I'd like to now introduce Ted Ballew, who's a former member of Victoria, having entered Parliament in 1999 as a member for Hawthorne. He was elected leader of the Liberal Party in 2006, becoming Victoria's 46th Premier and Minister for Arts from 2010 to 2013 and he retired from Parliament in 2014. Ted has been associated with dowry abuse campaigns in Victoria since 2012. Please join me in welcoming Ted Ballew. Uh, thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here for a number of reasons. But uh, I'm very conscious that change can be hard, but change can also be easy. And the difference between making it hard and easy is when people stand up and do something. And this issue is only going in one direction. Can I uh, acknowledge Linda and say, well done on your commitment, and Louise and Julian, well done on the Senate report. It's a fantastic report. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, it will lead to uh, change as soon as possible. And it's been an honour to stand with Manjula uh, wherever. And I said to her, I will go to any, any venue, uh, any opportunity. And we did. We went to lots of venues and there might have been only 10 or 20 people there. And I kept doing that after I stopped being Premier. And... Uh, I will continue to do it. So I'm here because the pact says, Manjula asked me to be here. I will be here, even in Sydney. <laughs> Part of the exercise here is to legitimise uh, and make credible and most of all make normal what Manjula and others are seeking to do, which is to make this change and to talk publicly about an issue which has been behind the scenes and buried. And that's the process. It's about moving the line. And it's also about building confidence of those victims of dowry abuse to come forward, to speak up and to know that help is available. And of course, we have particular views of dowry abuse. It's not just a South Asian issue, it's a Middle Eastern issue, it's an African issue as well. And dowry cuts both ways. In some cultures it's paid by the man, in some places it's obviously it's paid, paid by the woman. So there are variations. But where there's abuse, the abuse has to stop and we have to make calling it out um, part of that normalisation. We have to actually mainstream Manjula's work and the work that everybody else in this room is doing. So the Victorian uh, government, and a credit to Daniel Andrews, has picked up this issue. Uh, it's, the it's the change we need. And I think there's room to do likewise in other jurisdictions where, where it's needed. And it's about getting the definition in there. It's about getting the alignment in there into the legislation. But more than that, it's about normalising that discussion about dowry abuse is legitimate and providing the confidence to those who've been victims of it to come forward. I've said on many times, many occasions in Manjula's presence, I made it very clear, family violence is a crime. And dowry abuse is uh, legislated in Victoria as family violence. It's a crime. 
I think it's right not to criminalise dowry. That's not going to happen. Whether it's glory box or formal dowry in whichever direction it goes. But coercive or abusive dowry is a crime and we need to get that message across loud and clear. Um, as I said, it's not just Indian South Asian. It's much more widespread for the, than that and we have to understand. It's also complex and everybody knows that. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you to Manjula and uh, don't stop. Thanks very much. Julian, thank you for nudging me this opportunity to take this issue uh, into the Senate. Uh, my, it was an utter privilege and uh, not always an easy one uh, to chair this inquiry. Uh, and in large part, uh, it's, it was the visibility of the stories of those who uh, had suffered through dowry abuse before the inquiry that really made a difference uh, to the recommendations. And I want to tell you that in a very real way. We took in camera evidence and some of you are here today. Thank you for telling us your stories. Um, not only were they traumatic and horrific stories of abuse and manipulation, and you could see both the, cu the cultural and social context of that, but you could also see very clearly where the system had let people down in terms of there being no safety net to protect people uh, from this abuse and manipulation. So when you look at our recommendations, I want to tell you what a difference your own personal stories made to that. The kind of example that Julian gave where we talked about the kind of lies that a spouse might be told uh, before they come into Australia where, you know, they, you have to disclose all your own information but your spouse has told you a bunch of lies. Or the things where the immigration department, where you know, frankly, that a joint bank account is something you can use to prove to the immigration department that you've got a shared life in Australia. But in fact, what that becomes is a, is a place to for your dowry to be deposited so that it can then be um, exploited by uh, the abuser. And these are very real examples of the kind of abuse that's taken place, but really how there are systemic things in the Australian system that have facilitated it. And the solutions, are, we will need to pursue them in education and international education and work with higher education and um, uh, education providers, full international um, student fee paying uh, organisations uh, and whether they're universities or private companies, family law, uh, immigration, social security, there are parts of that net where you have been let down by the Australian system. Um, but as Linda has highlighted, uh, we now have uh, a real story to tell where we can take that mandate for change to uh, the government departments with a mandate uh, from this report and from the goodwill of uh, the Labor Party's commitment to this issue and indeed from good people like Ted to drive this change. So I proudly now welcome Dr Manjula O'Connor, keynote speaker for today, who will speak to us on dowry abuse, mental health and human rights. Dr. Manjula O'Connor is a renowned psychiatrist in Melbourne with a focus on family violence in migrant communities. Dr. Manjula has been a key active campaigner, has been recognised for her advocacy on dowry abuse, as we all know, and learnt so much from you. Manjula is a white ribbon advocate and works tirelessly in preventing men's violence against women, has been key in our diversity programme work for the last four years. I acknowledge the women with lived experience who are in this room. They are from all over the country. They are from Brisbane, they are from Adelaide, from Sydney, and from uh, Victoria. And we have women who have come from India so that we can learn about their transnational experience. We have two women who have come from India and who, ex who actually demonstrate multi-layered problem that we have heard from uh, 
Julian and, uh, and Louise before about uh, why this problem is an international problem and we in Australia are at the forefront of fighting this. So the mental health consequences of domestic violence and family violence are very serious. And as Henry mentioned, the burden of disease in young women is highest due to domestic violence and the majority cost is due to mental health ahead of hypertension, obesity, and smoking. Professor, Associate Professor Susan Reese has published in extensive data about this and I will leave that to her to speak more about it later on. And I do want to talk about Vikram Patel's group in India who were the first people in the world to show that dowry abuse is associated with suicidal behavior and first onset depressive illness. And, uh, and there is enormous information on dowry abuse in India. What we decided to do was to do community participatory theater. So what we felt was that family violence and domestic violence are such complex issues there are multiple narratives and there are multiple conflicting narratives that it was theater that could best expose, explore and expose those kind of issues. So what we did was that um, in uh, 2010, when I started to observe that there was a very familiar pattern of family violence that was uh, uh, being observed in, Aust in Australia, in the Indian community, we put forward a theater project to uh, explore this issue further as a community-based participatory research. The aim of it was not just to collect data, but also to support the community in creating an effective change. One of the ma major concerns we had at the time was that in 2009 to 10, the number of domestic, uh, victims of domestic violence from the South Asian community seeking help was less than 5%. I did a, a quick uh, survey by ringing all the service providers in, the, in, in Victoria and, and most of the people were of concern, were, were really concerned that why the Indian women were not coming forward. So we formed a team at the University of Melbourne School of Population Health with the Drummond Street service provider and community organization uh, Disha and the Sikh temple and we then created this uh, community participatory theater that was a basis of action research. So the me method of action research was innovative as a theater, community participatory theater had not really had much uh, at that time recognized as a uh, research tool. And our approach was underpinned by a deeply held belief in the rights and capacities of the community in making decisions and coming to collective uh, dialogue. In dealing with this complex problem, such as family violence, as I said, there are multiple versions of every story and multiple intersecting uh, factors. And so we felt that uh, community participatory theater offered a useful strategy to explore the existence and intersection of these contrasting versions, leading to the development of a shared appreciation of the truth in inverted commas, the forces that drive family violence while simultaneously moving from facts to understanding the story and changing the story by exploring forms of restorative truths. Utilizing a feminist informed approach, we formed this, uh, we, we collected data and this research was uh, published in uh, two uh, peer reviewed journals. Can we have the videotape, please? I know they make such a good couple. Now, let's arrangement. Yes, yes. What is it? I have a fixed deposit for my son's $100,000 deposit. Raj is also our son. We want to use money after the marriage. And she wants to use the arrangements after राज हमारा भी बेटा है 
आप किसी भी चीज की चिंता मत कीजिए जो भी आपकी मांग है सब पूरी हो जाएगी ऑल यू हैव टू डू इज गेट रेडी गेट द बॉय टू द मैंडा पे बैठ से तो रिश्ता पक्का समझे अरे चलो पहले तो मिलना पड़ेगा चलो तो फिर शादी के लिए पक्का बाय राज बेटा and there is no such arranged marriage in india today yes. it's a total false <laughs> this is not right india has changed the force honestly the thing is this that they are talking about cities but if you go to villages 90% is like a story but if you are not aware because you never been to villages that's exactly i want to say uh, uh, against what shavadi said still majority of indian marriages are like this hidden hidden sort of a pack or a Uh, you how much you will give for my daughter it's not open that much as used to be uh, many years mm-hmm. ago but indirectly still dowry is there and i think it is quite actually disappointing to see uh, i can understand that the two mother are not standing up you know that is an issue mm-hmm. but still to these two young uh, people the, the 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 boy who wants to get married or the girl who's getting married for them not to stand up for mm. in this day and age not not to actually mm. say that if i don't want to marry i don't want to get mm. get married to this person or i wouldn't want to go this through this exercise mm. in order to just you know uh, fulfill your expectation so the parents expectations are being fulfilled that's right also uh, demonstrates what maybe women are expected to bring to the marriage mm-hmm. when they discuss the man they're discussing his job how good a job it is uh, that he's living in melbourne um and where is the woman's family all they can offer is a dowry and that's all that's discussed and we don't get any idea of what background she has you know whether she's educated the more you educate the girl child it 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 does help improve the entire scenario but uh at the end it's uh, it's about the the society like you do not see this stuff uh, with rich people mm. they they uh, with people with high status and stuff it it's less among them it's more among the no. uh, people who are <laughs> I think so the the audience who were community members they were invited to comment on the scene and at that reveal that the cultural expectation of dowry is deeply embedded into the psyche of the cult of the community and that is why the abuse occurs easily and the other interesting thing in my clinical experience is that when the uh, groom's family are making coercive demands the woman actually blames herself for not giving enough they have internalized the system to such an enormous extent but cultures and attitudes are cult- contextually determined and they do change and so that was the reason we went in we went in with the assumption that culture and family violence is amenable to change so in one community theater action research we asked the community to propose solutions the actors the audience proposed the solutions and the actors um the actors had to act it out the improvised solutions so that will help us further to create break down barriers as we write about that in literature and um uh and bring it to the attention of authorities so the impact of attention action research has been strong it has helped to break profound silence around family violence in the indian and the south asian communities at large and and the most interesting thing is that from being extremely low users of services in 2009 in um last year at the sps punjabi program 
1800 Respect program um, a media person announced that Indian women were the biggest callers to 1800 Respect now. They are the biggest users of the service. And so whilst we cannot take full credit for that, but we can take some credit for bringing it to the attention of the communities. Thank you. And so the abuse of dowry, we must not allow it to go underground because it is a contributor to much mental illness. And this were the couple of papers that uh, I've just um, shown up there to show you that, yes, it is being recognized in the lit Australian literature as well. So dowry is centuries old custom and the custom originated out of respect and concern for the young bride. In a patriarchal system where the sons inherit the ancestral property, dowry was and still remains an anti-mortem gift in lieu of inheritance. Over the centuries, gold has played a key role in dowry and it is usually given because gold can be quickly liquidated in times of need. So it's a practice I've observed in India from the time I was a child and Dr. Shalu Nigam from Delhi will talk to us more about this. So how do we define dowry? It's gifts given in consideration of a marriage. And these gifts are oversized gifts. Usually they are multiple times the income of the family. And many times the families give it because they are afraid that if they do not give the dowry gifts to the bride, she will be subjected to violence. It's kind of a gift. It's not a gift. It's a societal compulsion that is being given out of fear so that parents feel safer, that their daughters will be safe. They will not be killed if they have enough dowry. So with increasing migration, the issue has come to Australia. An intersectionality of issue puts the Indian migrant brides at greater risk. They are on temporary visas, they are on student visa, tourist visa, partner visas, and their visas can be revoked by the groom. Risks, fear, threats of separation from their children are all in there. And many of women have been deported back from Australia, back to India. So the dowry abuse is also a financial abuse. It morphs into financial abuse, like taking money, making her go to work, taking money from the bank account. The password is only controlled by the perpetrator. Pressurizing victim to transferring wages or any cash gifts into a joint account that only the perpetrator controls. Not paying bills or making her pay the bills. Stealing the jewelry keeping that, or making credit cards in her name and running up the bills. And she is paying for them. And I know many of women who have paid the debts of their husbands who were on student loans and then been ab uh, abandoned by those husbands. The human rights angle. So the um United Nations set a common standard on human rights with the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And Article 1 states that all human beings are born equal, free, in dignity and rights. So the Convention of, in, of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDA, defines domestic violence and dowry abuse. They have actually put word dowry abuse in there as abuse of human rights under Article 1 as discrimination against women. And they have defined Article 1 as di discrimination against women as physical, sexual and psychological abuse violence occurring in the family, including dowry-related violence and other traditional practices that are harmful to women, as well as non-spousal violence and violence related to exploitation. So the immigrant women arriving in Australia in, on partner visa often fail to recognize they are going through family domestic violence. They do not recognize their rights to have protection under the UN Charter of Human Rights. Physical violence is still easier to identify, but financial abuse is not. 
In, in uh, recognition of that, we commenced a public campaign against dowry in 2014, and the petition was signed up by up to 600 members, and then we are so proud to have the former Premier Ted Bellew in our audience who tabled the petition and set the ball rolling. And so we have achieved quite a few milestones and it is, was absolutely amazing that we actually now can see, look forward to it as being a transnational uh, problem and solutions. And then we had this breaking news of the Senate inquiry. So I can thank Senator Louise Pratt and Senator Je uh, Julian Hill enough and Linda Burney for being here. So thank you. The first point I want to make is that women with exposure to violence from an intimate partner are at much increased risk of mental disorders in their lifetime. In fact, the evidence shows, including from our own nationally representative study of 4,551 women, that uh, intimate partner violence is strongly associated with severe current mental disorder, higher rates of lifetime mental disorders and impaired quality of life. So when we look at the dose-response relationship um, between gender-based violence and post-traumatic stress disorder alone, um, the, uh, the uh, strength of the association is even stronger. So dowry abuse, which occurs in intimate relationships, whether it's physical or financial or emotional abuse, may be a strong risk factor for mental disorder, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Dowry has been associated with um, mental disorder by Vikram Patel and colleagues in India. And our studies in Timor Leste have reported associations between bride price, intimate partner violence, and mental distress. Although the custom of bride price varies in detail and implementation across diverse cultures, the core universal element involves the transfer of offerings, goods or funds principally from the groom and his family to the bride's family, as opposed to from the bride's family to the groom with dowry. Both, though, are very similar when they're exploited. With both practices, women are associated with an economic price. And where there is a lower gender status, they are at risk of maltreatment and blame. Bride price obligations occur both at the time of marriage and in many societies, including Timor-Leste, for an indefinite period thereafter. Commonly, increased expectations of payments and offerings occur during ceremonial events, like uh, the birth of children and at funerals. If not enough money is paid and the wife's family is dissatisfied, she can be castigated or physically abused by the husband and his family. The bride price custom is really widespread. It, it occurs in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and the Pacific. And of course, the practice extends to migrants and refugees who come to Australia and other high-income countries. Um, our study of 1,672 women in Timor-Leste applied measures of a stress for bride price and the World Health Organization measure for intimate partner violence. <coughs> we found that compared with those with no problem with bride price, women with a moderate or severe problem with a custom reported higher rates of intimate partner violence. It was 18% compared with 43.6%. So dowry abuse in all its forms has been eloquently described by Manjula O'Connor as being associated with violence against women, mental disorder and increased risk for suicide here in Australia. When the data are analysed from our systematically recruited cohort study, we will be able to examine if dowry or bride price is interrelated with violence against women at a population level. And if it is also a factor in the prevalence of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental disorders and settlement outcomes. What we do know, the one thing we do know, <laughs> is that the risk factor that stands out above all is gender inequality. 
dowry concerns the commodification of women and then the coercive and controlling exploitation of them for financial gain. These forms of violence against women can only occur when they have less powerful status in the family and in the community. I call gender inequality the last bastion of change. It's the most referred to in the discourse, but it's the least examined in terms of its root causes. We should be asking the question, to what extent is gender inequality responsible for abuse related to dowry? And how can we ensure that it doesn't continue to happen here in Australia? In answering this question, I think it's important to reflect on the intersection between culture and gender and to clarify how this is necessary in understanding dowry abuse. The main premise of intersectional theory is that gender oppression is modified by intersections with other forms of inequality and oppression. What an intersectional analysis makes clear is that almost everyone experiences both privilege and subordination. Clearly, while white Western women are oppressed by their gender positioning, they also receive privileges through their whiteness. Similarly, while non-Western immigrant men um, are oppressed by race and, race and cl um, class and racial hierarchies, they still receive some forms of gender privilege in their personal relationships, and they have power and control and can use it to the extent that it is harmful to women. This is what is occurring in the case of dowry abuse. Gender inequality is a key area where all men must recognise um, their own, or own and own the harm related to power, their power and privilege, related to their gender and to their culture, and in so doing seek to challenge it and to change oppressive practices. Clearly though, there are dangers in acknowledging class and cultural variations in men's violence against women. I do not want to contribute to the false belief that violence against others, the, violent, the false belief that violence against women is only something that happens to others. We have to be careful not to simply blame the culture of the immigrant or refugee family or women whatever their culture or ethnic background are at risk of experiencing violence. So we stand here as a collective today against human rights violations and against dowry abuse. With this momentum, I feel incredibly positive that change will occur and with it an improved mental health and wellbeing for all women. Thank you. Thanks. So at that point, I'd like to bring up Shelley McGuff, and she is an expert in a lawyer. She's an expert also from New Delhi. Thank you for coming again. Thanks. My presentation is divided into uh, four parts. Uh, I will talk about the magnitude of the problem, conviction rates in India, uh, they are low, but why they are low, uh, then uh, transnational violence, then the race ahead. We have this report called National Crime, uh, you know, Crimes in India, which is taken out by National Crime Record Bureau. The latest report which came is in 2016. Now, that report says that 39 crimes against women are being reported every hour in India. Whether in or like, you know, public places or in homes, women are suffering. The Lok Sabha we have in India. So this question was raised and uh, the Ministry of External Affairs replied that in 2017 they got 186 cases of you know NRI non-resident Indian spouses who have reported dowry abuse uh, or related complaints. In 2016, this figure was 1510, and uh, you know it's been increasing. Um, so uh, and also there there are cases where groups <coughs> have solemnized multiple marriages. Uh, now there again there is no research, no data has been collected. But it has been estimated that in Punjab alone, there are 30,000 women who, who are being abandoned, where the husband has migrated to some other country, women are left behind. Uh, so these are just estimates. So, uh, coming to dowry deaths, from 2005 to 2015, over a period of PK, within 10 years, 88,467 women have been murdered, burned alive, 
killed for not fulfilling the dowry demands. So that means around you know every 20 minutes, one minute run. Uh, in 2015 alone, 7,634 women were killed for dowry. And this figure is 7,621 in 2016. Uh, this is despite of the fact that dowry is recognized as a cognizable offense. That means recognized as a very serious offense under the Indian law where you know women are being uh, burned or you know, being murdered. Like, there is another survey that is National Family Health Survey 3 and 4. 3 was conducted in 2005-2006 and National Family Health Survey in 2015-16 uh, uh, that was uh, survey 4. So, this uh, report is very important because it says that 76% of women who face domestic violence, they never sought help. So patriarchy is so deeply internalized that married women think that it is justified for the husband to beat a woman. So if they ignore, you know, if they uh, ignore their housewife duties, if they reduce sex, so the husband has right to beat them. Conviction rate is 34, 34.7% for dowry deaths. 14% under like, cruelty uh, by husband and in-laws and 18.5% under Dolly Prohibition Act. So, you know, these uh, many percentages of people are uh, being penalized. The rest are roaming free. So, why conviction rate is low in India? Uh, many reasons. Um, Dolly and domestic violence, they are considered as a less serious crime. Legal procedure is specifically tested in case of family violence. The veil of family privacy is being used to, uh, you know, shield and we be glorifying the family, but we are underestimating the violence within the system. Uh, then uh, another problem is that there is a backlash. When we have, we are seeing a lot of other problems, there is a narrative, there is a discourse which says that women are misusing and abusing this law. a fantastic job. Can we thank all of those wonderful people up the back who've just seamlessly gone around and made things happen. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. So do each of you have a copy of this proposed resolution on your table? Okay.